Hello and welcome to the Northeast Law Review. My name is Nathan Cooper and this is Rebecca Bestley and we are joined today by Dr Sue Farron who is a lecturer and reader in law at Newcastle University. Uh, Sue has written extensively on the adoption practices of Pacific Island states, particularly Fiji, Tonga and Samoa. Um, and we're going to be speaking to Sue about her most recent paper um, relating to the plural practice of adoption in the Pacific Island states. Hello to you, Sue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, firstly, a question which I think needs to be asked before we um, start adding meat to the bone. I think the first thing that people are going to want to hear when they listen to this um, at home is what is the plural adoption practice that your paper refers to? The plural adoption practice is the practice of customary adoption among the Torres Strait Islander communities in the very far north of Australia. They, like quite a lot of other Pacific Islanders, have an informal, unrecorded, non-state, if you like, type of adoption. But all of these countries also have the type of adoption that we might be more familiar with, which is state controlled and usually yeah. goes through the courts and has lots of safeguards to it. So these customary adoption practices, which have been practiced for generations, don't have the same paper trail or formality that state adoption has. And that can be quite disadvantageous to those who are adopted um, when they need paper evidence as to who they are, where do they come from. Um, and as we all know, quite often, just to secure basic uh, rights and documents in the modern day and age, we need to show a utility bill, our driving license, sometimes a birth certificate. So if you have a process whereby your legal status changes because of customary adoption, you haven't got that sort of written record. So basically you have problems in accessing schooling, accessing government loans, getting a passport, getting a visa, traveling to other countries, all those sort of things that we might take for granted. Thank you. Um, can you like tell us why you were so interested in this topic area? I've done a lot of research on family law and personal law in um, the South Pacific. And as soon as you start doing that, you begin to realize that there's more than one system of law that applies. So for example, there may be three different sorts of marriage law that applies, civil marriage, church marriage, and customary marriage. Um, and the same is true in terms of adoption. So I'd written a, a monograph on family law some time ago, family law in the Pacific. Um, and I've done quite a lot of sort of individual papers and I'd worked with my um, co-author, Jennifer Corrin, on a number of projects. And in fact, this particular article originated somewhat um, fortuitously. I was phoned during lockdown by uh, a radio station in Australia that had come across the book, The Plural Practice of Adoption in Pacific Islands. And I'd done some work with them ages ago before commenting on something that had happened in the Pacific. So I got this totally random communication saying, uh, would you speak to us about this? So I had a lockdown radio interview from my sofa, basically, um, <laughs> and got, got into this. And then I contacted Jennifer and said, how about we do an article on this? And so it went from there, really. So it sounds like this is going to be a walk in the park for you then, if you've already done Australian radio. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so you mentioned you mentioned at the start of that you're talking about um, different influences of, of specific laws. The fact that this this essentially more than one law governing um, a particular practice. Um, you've also mentioned in the book that you've wrote um, in the article rather uh, about the application of the Hague Convention. Now, people reading out there, or people watching this rather, may not um, be totally aware of what that is. It relates to child abduction. As I'm aware. I'm it's child adoption rather than abduction, although sometimes the line between the two isn't that clear. It's an international treaty um, or convention which countries can sign up to, to try and regulate the movement of children across jurisdictions. So if we think of baby selling or baby farming um, and the demand for children for adoption, where 
uh, demand outstrips supply in a lot of developed countries, but supply outstrips demand in undeveloped countries. So you have the movement of infants um, across jurisdictions. And basically the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption is to try and put in place agreed international safeguards for those children so that they aren't traded as commodities. I was just wondering um, about, you, you mentioned about international law. Um, can you explain why this may cause complications for plural practice um, adoption? Well, international law is just between states and therefore where you've got a system of a plural legal system where you've got state law alongside non-state law, it's only going to be those processes that go through the state procedures that are likely to be caught by any international agreement. So in most countries, there's formal adoption laws and those formal adoption laws do deal with applications for adoption by out of country um, applicants. So for example, say, I don't know, an American wanting to adopt a Samoan baby because there's a Samoan population in America. And so there may be relatives in Samoa who have got a teenage daughter who's got pregnant and doesn't want to keep the baby. They can go through the formal legal adoption channels and there'll be safeguards that that adoption is in the best interests of the child, um, that all the parties involved know what they're consenting to, that the adoptive parents are appropriate and suitable and have been checked out, etc. So an international convention will kick in there because you've got a child being moved from its country of birth to country of adoption. In a customary adoption, you won't go through the court at all. It'll be a, a family arrangement, quite often an extended family arrangement. So in that sort of example, the, the teenage unmarried mother may be pressurized by her family to give the baby to um, an auntie to raise. Perhaps that auntie hasn't got any children or hasn't got a boy or hasn't got a girl or has got more resources. And so you get a customary adoption where there's no court involved. There's no written agreement or anything. And that auntie may then move to New Zealand and take the baby with them. So there'll be no international law that's applied to the movement of that child. So that's where you've got problems with international law reaching all the different parts of a plural legal system. Is that in, in, in itself one of the issues that, um, that presents itself in relation to the size of the country? So you, you've already mentioned um, that size and the remoteness of the specific island um, can impact um, the issues relating to these customary adoptions. So is that to say that if um, somebody who had informally adopted a child emigrated to a country that's um, small and remote, it would be therefore difficult um, to be brought into line with the laws surrounding customary adoptions? Not so much, because when you cross borders like that, you've got customs and immigration. Um, so you've got to go through some paperwork. So I don't think it's so much size in terms of the control, but size is relevant to resources. So for example, um, a lot of the adoption law that was introduced into states that were former colonies of Britain um, presume that there's going to be some child support agencies, presume that there's going to be some kind of um, professional body that can say this is in the best interest of the child or these adoptive parents are appropriate. You know, like we have checks on child safety uh, yeah. and that sort of thing. So we've got a whole raft of professionals that can advise a court in terms of what's in the best interest of the child. If you've got a country in the developing world that hasn't got all these resources, then it's going to be very difficult to tick all the boxes. So it's not so much the movement across borders as really um, trying to put in place sophisticated systems when you haven't got the resources or the skills yeah. or the people to, to back up those sophisticated systems. Um, so you've mentioned about international law. How important is it to have a sufficient relationship between the two systems within a country? Well, I think it's very important because otherwise you've got a sector of the population who basically falls outside any determinants of legal status. 
So if you take the Torres Strait Islanders, this cultural practice of adoption has gone on for generations. But people who are adopted by what's called under the new legislation, a cultural parent, have no paper trail. This is an arrangement between families. Whereas if somebody is adopted formally through the courts, then that adopted child becomes the full child of the adopted parents, the adoptive parents. So if you're an adopted person, for example, in England and Wales, you go through the courts, the, the application goes through the courts, and basically the status of that adopted child shifts from the biological parent, parent, to the adoptive parent, parents. And the adoptive parents then have full control of the child, but that child has full rights against their new adoptive parents, particularly things like rights of support, rights of inheritance, rights to take their name. And yes, okay, when they're adult, they may want to seek out who their biological mother or father were. But in the interim, they've still got full legal rights, um, just as anybody else has. Whereas if you don't have full legal rights for a sector of the population, basically you're discriminating against them on the basis of their birth status. Now, Sue, I'm going to attempt to uh, ask you some quite detailed questions um, relating to Chapter 7, which uh, of this uh, 2019 Plural Practice of Adoption paper, which relates specifically to the uh, Pacific Island state of Tonga. Uh, you mentioned how the social structure and the constitutional monarchy within Tonga can have influences on the way in which the adoption practices, customary or formal, um, can be influenced. In what ways would the constitutional monarchy or the social structures uh, impact and shape the way that these practices are viewed in that country? Well, Tonga, like many countries in the Pacific, places a lot of emphasis on the um, honour of women and also the importance yeah. of the family. And most families are extended families. Particularly in Tonga, there's a, a large number of Tongans in the diaspora uh, living in the United States, New Zealand, um, and Australia, which is significant for the movement of people. They're also a very Christian country, which may surprise some people to know that in the Pacific, religion is really, really important, and the majority of people are churchgoers. So, where children are born out of wedlock, they have attitudes that we might be more familiar with perhaps in the 1950s, 1960s in England and Wales. So they are less tolerant perhaps of illegitimacy. So there's an effort to absorb um, children born out of wedlock into the extended family or to shift them to um, other members of the extended family who may or may not be in Tonga. Like many countries in the Pacific, Tonga adopted legislation that was primarily modeled on Western laws, so from a completely different cultural and social context. And it is possible to formally adopt in Tonga, but only children born out of wedlock. It's impossible to adopt children um, who, who aren't, don't, don't fall under that status. So all that's allowed is guardianship. Now, if somebody becomes a guardian of a child, that's normally a temporary arrangement. And so where there are customary adoptions, so children are placed with a member of the extended family, they can only be recognized as being children under guardianship, not fully adopted, which means that this has pr presented a number of problems in terms of moving those children to live in or among the diaspora. So for example, taking a child who uh, one is a legal guardian for to New Zealand, requires a visa. That can't be granted to a guardian because it would only be a temporary measure because the guardianship is notionally only temporary. And so these customary adoptions mean that these children really fall into some sort of hole or hiatus. Yeah. Um, they can't be formally adopted and the customary adoption doesn't entitle them to the paperwork they need to move to other Tongan communities in the world. So that leaves them at a, a real disadvantage. And it also means that there's a temptation 
to take children who are customarily adopted out of Tonga informally on temporary visas um, and then lose them among the diaspora. So there's the concern that these children may not be adequately safeguarded because they don't go through any form, really formal procedure um, to make sure that this is going to be in their best interests. So, so, so those are the sort of, that's the sort of social context that informs uh, the law. It also means that in a society like in Tonga, which is very, very conservative, trying to implement any change to the existing status quo raises all sorts of debates and controversies. Um, so it's very difficult to get law reform uh, through the, the parliament, which is dominated by even more traditional people, essentially uh, the nobles uh, in, in what is a fairly hierarchical social structure in Tonga. Um, now, in relation to reform, um, you were just saying about how practices could be potentially uh, altered, rather, um, in Tonga. In, in terms of reform, there's been a, uh, reforms in Australia, which you've recently written about, as far as I understand, it's to be published. Uh, the, the title of the article is the Torres Straits lead the way in legislating for Kupai Omaska in the Pacific. Um, so the attempt to reform known as the, this is a mouthful, I'll warn you now, uh, the Torres Straits Island Child Rearing Practice Act 2020. Um, I want to ask whether you think that has gone far enough um, in terms of promoting the rights of customarily adopted children um, in Australia. It's certainly gone a long way to addressing some of the wrongs that they've been experiencing in terms of discrimination um, and access to benefits that are status directed. Um, it's also been a very brave and long-winded attempt, because this has taken about 20 years to get onto the statute books, to recognize that the cultural practices of the Torres Strait Islanders are not the same as formal adoption. So you can't just use Western labels to describe different cultural practices of people. So that's why it's called the Child Rearing Practice Act. And it, its full title actually incorporates um, an Aboriginal uh, description of this cultural yeah. practice, which goes much deeper than just placing a child in the home of somebody else. It's associated with all sorts of aspects of society, spirituality um, and beliefs in terms of their, who they are as a people. I think one of the drawbacks with it is that there will still be, inevitably, I suppose, and pragmatically, at least for the time being, two parallel pathways for Torres Strait Islanders. Those who apply to get um, an adoption certificate or recognition of the customary adoption certificate will be on the pathway to getting all the necessary documents that they need, just like any other person who's adopted under Australian law. Those who don't apply will still fall in the gap. So there may be adults, for example, who are adopted in custom years ago and now reached adulthood, who don't get the right paperwork. So for a while, there's going to be this parallel system. The other problem is that the two parallel tracks will collide when it comes to any dispute because they will be heard by the normal court processes. Now, although these are children's courts with specialized um, judges and, and, and advisors and counsel and that sort of thing, they are basically courts designed under a Western adversarial process. Um, and although some rules of evidence may be waived, basically what you're doing is taking something that's initially recognized as being totally distinct from Western adoption practice, then you're funneling it into a Western court process. So how viable are the comparisons between this act in the Australian context and the context of the Pacific Island states? Well, the Torres Strait Islanders are Melanesian people, essentially. I mean, they, they move quite frequently between the far north of Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, some of the islands 
in the Torres Straits are actually closer to Papua New Guinea than they are to Australia. So there's a lot of cultural similarity between those two countries. And then Papua New Guinea is part of the Melanesian sort of collection of, of Pacific Islanders is very close to Vanuatu and Solomon Islands and part of Fiji. So where you've got similarities in terms of cultural practices, then arguably there's scope for using comparative law reform to inform practices in both directions, if you like. Um, and all the Pacific countries that we covered in the book have started to look at reforming adoption law, primarily to look at for, uh, reforming the adoption law that they inherited under colonial influence, and rather less so to look at how they incorporate customary uh, adoption practices. But Papua New Guinea does have quite a good example in terms of its legislation in 1968, which, do, which does actually recognize customary adoption and is looking to reform it further. So I think there can be a two way sort of comparative reflection because it is a shared problem. Now, aside from the, um, the cultural differences you've already mentioned in terms of the, the customary adoption, which is um, much more abundant in these, in these Pacific Island states, you actually mentioned um, Vanuatu. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've actually been a, a researcher professor there. Is that correct? At the University of uh, South Pacific? Yes, that's right. The University of the South Pacific. I was an associate so you, professor there. So you essentially have the first hand, the first hand um, experience to draw upon how similar these states are to Western states. Are there any sort of big blockbuster differences aside from what, uh, what we just mentioned about the uh, the informal customary practices, which would naturally inhibit any sort of comparison between a Western state um, and their practices and these, these small Pacific Island remote states? Loads. <laughs> Loads of differences. Um, I suppose primarily what you've got, not just in the Pacific, but also in, in many other parts of the world where you've got plural legal systems in indigenous people, is what is referred to in South Africa as traditional living law. So we talk about traditional practices and customary law, but it's not frozen in time. <clears throat> it adapts to meet new circumstances. So for example, <clears throat> excuse me, in a lot of the Pacific, land is held under customary land tenure. So we think about, you know, land freehold and leasehold and things, and those exist um, as well. They've been introduced into a number of those countries. But in, in most countries in the Pacific, almost all land is held under customary land tenure. And as um, some people will be aware, in Australia, this has been a really big issue with Aboriginal land rights, and it's similar in Canada with First Nation land rights where land is claimed because of traditional ties to the land rather than because there's a, a formal piece of paper or deed saying that somebody owns it. So that's one of the, the big differences. Another difference going back to family law is that um, there is a practice of customary marriage. So customary marriage quite often involves particularly in Solomon Islands, um, and to in Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea, what some people would condemn as the sale of women, but is uh, referred to as bride price. Again, it exists in Africa um, in terms of gifts given by one family to the other for the exchange of the woman to the man's family um, and can extend to any children who are born before the marriage is finalized. Um, there's also the situation where you have different systems of courts. So in a number of these countries, you've got customary courts or traditional courts, which may deal with certain matters that never reach the other courts, the formal state courts, or there may be appeal from these customary courts to the state courts. So again, rather changing from you know, one side of the track to the other side of the track. So yes, there's, there's actually quite a lot of, of differences, which is why we refer to them as, as plural legal systems. 
And the, I suppose the other major difference, and again, this doesn't relate just to the Pacific Islands, is that as we become more globalized and there's more demand for uh, similarity of laws or consensus in terms of what we think um, should be happening internationally, there's a lot of pressure on these countries to change their laws according to agendas which they may not set. So you think of, I don't know, the World Trade Organization, for example, will say that if you want to be a member of our organization, you've got to put in place certain laws regarding intellectual property. Well, that's fine, but then you've got to find the people to enforce those laws with the skills and expertise that's needed to do so. So a lot of this compliance with world established agendas means that there are a lot of resource um, pressures being put on countries that really cannot deliver on those. Um, so while they will want to be members of the international community, and indeed are members of the international community, the sort of legal expectations that the international community um, raises, in practical terms, are really very unrealistic. Well, I think that's all the questions that we had. Um, but is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about your work that you've come across that we haven't mentioned already? Well, maybe just to fill in a bit of background in terms of why the Pacific. Um, that was actually completely random because um, and some kind of message went around. I think this may have been, you know, early days of email saying that the University of South Pacific was looking for somebody to draw up um, a module on the equivalent of human rights. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So um, I applied and I got it and I went to the South Pacific for two months uh, to Fiji, actually, where part of the university is, because the University of the South Pacific is a regional university uh, with 13 countries as members of the university. And it has uh, campuses in Fiji, Samoa and Vanuatu. And the law school was originally in Fiji and now is in Vanuatu, which is why I was in Vanuatu. Um, and from there, I then went back as a Commonwealth uh, Fellow, and then I got a random email in, I think it was probably 1998 or something, saying, oh, we've got a vacancy, would you like to apply? So I thought, oh, well, why not? Um, and I did, and I got it. Uh, and so well, that's why I ended up in Vanuatu. But my interest in terms of the Pacific was really inspired by having studied comparative law as an undergraduate doing my LLB, which made me realize that we all face similar legal problems and issues, but we resolve them in different ways. And I find it really interesting to see how different legal systems cope with similar issues. Um, so I've always been, I suppose, a comparativist, if you like. Um, and when you get to the South Pacific, basically what you've got are case studies on your doorstep uh, to look into how different countries approach similar issues. And the issue with the, this um, plural practice of adoption, I think, is, resonates much more broadly because it's a question of human rights and legal status. And we're very much aware at the moment about how different status affects how we're treated. If we think of Black Lives Matter, uh, which is you know, a global movement, it's just the randomness of who you are, where you're born, what color you are, what creed you are, that can determine that you're treated differently or similarly. And the same is true with people who are adopted in custom. They don't ask to be adopted in custom. That's just what happens. Um, and, and yet it affects their legal status. So broadly, it's a human rights issue that tra transcends jurisdictions or, or national boundaries um, and gives us something to think about in a comparative way. Oh, well, thank you very much. I think that's everything. Do you have any more questions, Nathan? No, I think you've, uh, you've covered a lot. That we're, uh, yeah. yeah, well, thank you very much for coming and agreeing to be interviewed. It was very nice having you on. Um, but I suppose we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for inviting me to this exciting. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys.